Applications to the Temporary Foreign Worker Program are significantly up in Banff and Canmore. Man has died in, quote, officer-involved shooting, unquote, in St. John's. CTV News asks, is rent control a bad thing? And New Zealand's public broadcaster is under fire after it was discovered a journalist had been changing Reuters articles to favor Russia's narrative. Good morning. It's Tuesday, June 13th. I'm Nora, and here are your headlines. First off, we start in Banff and Canmore, where businesses there have, quote, been given the green light to dramatically boost the number of temporary foreign workers they hire to fill low-wage positions, unquote. This is how Paula Duhacek from CBC News reported it. There have been an increase in positions that have been requested for the temporary foreign worker program, and they've been significant increases. 237 positions were approved for Canmore alone. In 2019, that number was only 98. In Banff, the increase is even higher. There have been 454 positions approved up from 141 in 2019. Jason Foster, Labor Relations and Human Resources professor at Athabasca University, called it, quote, kind of jaw-dropping, unquote. The article is written in caustically neutral language, language that offers no hint at why or who is making the offers, just that they're happening. Quote, employers across Canada have increasingly made use of the program, unquote, for example, and that this has, thanks to the government having, quote, temporarily eased limits, unquote, on how many people employers can try and hire. Further down in the article, it gets into specifics, but you do have to read quite a while before you get there. Employers can now hire up to 20% of their entire workforce from the program. That's double the number than before. And low-waged is defined as a job that pays less than $28.85 an hour. Here are some of the employers who have been approved with the highest number of approvals. In Banff, Banff Caribou Properties Limited got 120 positions. Rim Rock Resort Hotel got 40 positions. FHR Banff Operations Corporation, which is the company behind Fairmont Banff Springs, got 30 positions. In Canmore, KS Summers Enterprises got 73 positions. That is a McDonald's franchisee. And 2022994 Alberta Limited, a Tim Hortons franchisee, got 34 positions. CBC couldn't get any of the employers to talk to them about this, but they did get a quote from someone at Rimrock Resort saying that they are pro the program. Yeah, no kidding they are. Now, the first country of origin mentioned in this article, it's Australians and New Zealanders and how often people from these countries, they don't work through the temporary foreign worker program. They work in the region on holiday visas. And the bonus then of the temporary foreign worker program is that the workers can't just take off if they get a better job somewhere else, unlike a Canadian or a New Zealander. This creates, quote unquote, more stability, which is honestly a horrible way to describe the closest thing that we have to slave labor in this country and is very much racist. The point is not actually explained in this article. They just let it sit there and make it so that you're like, yeah, of course, more stability. Those New Zealanders, they keep screwing off. The article goes on to explain how actually this program is good because the worker benefits a lot from it. They get a foothold in Canada and they can, quote unquote, build up experience. All unattributed comments that sound like they are directly from an employer association itself and not from a journalist, frankly. They also feature one worker who, quote, is an example of that success story, unquote, someone who found a path to immigration from the Philippines after working at a Banff hotel. CBC talked with five others, all temporary foreign workers who had, quote, similar perspectives, unquote, which were left to assume meant that they're very, very happy with the program. It takes a long time to get to the part of the article that's called, quote, the case against the temporary foreign worker program. It's at the bottom after we've already heard that all of the temporary foreign workers that CBC has talked to loves the program. So we're supposed to, I don't know, measure that against what some academics think about the program who aren't even in Banff and Canmore, which is literally how the article posits them. They go back to Foster, who reminds readers that these workers cannot leave their jobs without risking everything. But don't worry. 
The article says the government, quote, recently strengthened protections for temporary foreign workers and that open work permits are available for those experiencing abuse, unquote. They don't unpack this. They don't get into any of those abuses. They don't actually explain what those abuses could be. And the whole thing is just assume that it is normal that non-white workers would come to Canada, be forced to work for an employer for some number of years, and maybe have the privilege of immigrating hereafter. It's really gross. The article is very long, and it's very bad. And it's a good example of fake neutrality that upholds aggressively upholds white supremacy. There are so many migrant justice organizations in Canada that could explain the program and how dangerous it can be for workers, but their voices are absent. Instead, this is pitched as a win-win with very little effort to interrogate the racism built into this exploitative program. The other thing that this article doesn't mention is the region's housing crisis. I certainly know many Canadians that would probably take even low-paid work and live out in Banff and Canmore for the rest of their lives if they could find a place to live. Last August, Alberta Health Services found that 42 beds and mattresses were in a single dwelling in Banff. They didn't say who was sleeping there, but you can't just bring people to work to Canada and expect them to either break into the brutal rental market or leave them to the whim of the employer to house them. Neither option is good. And this whole aspect of life and living in Canada is completely absent from this already too long article. Next, we go to St. John's, Newfoundland, Labrador, where the Canadian press is reporting that a man has died after probably being shot by a police officer. There are no details at all in the Canadian press story. And all they got was, quote, a man is dead following an quote unquote, officer involved shooting incident, unquote. A member of the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary, quote, sustained injuries, quote, but has since been released from hospital, the article writes. No word if the officer was the shooter or just happened to walk by and trip on the curb while he was watching what was happening. The incident is being probed by the police oversight body, and they said they couldn't say anything more as they were still trying to identify the individual's family. Next, we'll head back to Alberta, this time a story from Calgary with another frame that is like, wait, what? (laughs) An article by Nicole DiDonato titled, quote, Calgarians struggle with rising rental prices, but experts say rent control isn't the solution, unquote, appeared yesterday. DiDonato features a woman who sleeps on the couch while her teenage son gets the bedroom. They can't afford anything more, and they've been living like this for more than three years. Rent in Calgary is up 14.6% over last year. Calgary doesn't have rent control, so rents rise at the whims of the landlords. Despite this, Jerry Baxter from the Calgary Residential Rental Association doesn't think that rent control would stop anything. He claims that rent control will mean that people with lower rent will never leave their apartments, thereby driving up other people's rents. Now, Dee Donato doesn't immediately correct this silly fallacy. She doesn't ask a housing expert what rent control does uh, or whether or not there's any truth to what Baxter is saying. Does rent control actually have the opposite effect of what it is supposed to do? Does Calgary have lower average rent than Toronto and Vancouver because it doesn't have rent control? Or is it because Toronto and Vancouver are more popular places to launder money through the housing market? It's hard to say. We don't really get into this here. Rent control does keep rents lower. It does not solve a housing crisis, obviously, because housing crises aren't driven by rents. They're driven by a lack of available rental stock, and they're driven by speculation. But anyway, the article ends by going back to the woman who is sleeping on the couch and says, still, Vladarzik believes rental caps could still help people like her, unquote. Curiously absent also from the story is anything about Airbnbs and whether or not they're soaking up rental stock in Calgary. It's another pressure that does make it hard for people to find a place to rent in most cities in Canada. Anyway, the headline needs to be corrected. Di Donato spoke to one expert, and I'm not even sure that the guy really counts as an expert based on his comments. But there's definitely not two that say that rent control is ineffective. And finally, another story about press freedom bias and the invasion of Ukraine. I think that this is so fascinating. So I, I'll try not to focus too, too much on these kinds of stories. But honestly, this is just so interesting. I can I can help myself. Someone at the New Zealand public broadcaster RNZ has been changing wire copy from Reuters about the war to change the bias towards Russia and away from Ukraine. Paul Thompson, the chief executive of RNZ, called the changes that have been made to more than a dozen wire copy stories pro-Kremlin garbage. The changes violate Reuters policy, which says that their stories can only be modified with their permission. 
Paul Thompson said, quote, we've let our audience down and the Ukrainian community down. But I do need to make sure that we have a robust process because we've got enough challenges on our plate at the moment. And I don't want to compound that by getting ahead of a fair process. This is how it works if you're not sure about any of this. Reuters is a newswire service and news corporations from around the world pay money to be part of the wire service. They are able to print Reuters articles under the name of their news agency. This is why you'll see the Associated Press or Agence France Press or the Canadian Press in lots of different kinds of news agency stories. And so we've got someone at the public broadcaster in New Zealand that has been editing copy to become more pro-Russian from Reuters uh, articles. Reuters has linked to one of the articles, which was only just published on June 8th. Try to guess what was added. Here's the paragraph. Quote, in 2014, a pro-Russian elected government was toppled during Ukraine's violent made in color revolution and Russia annexed Crimea after a referendum as the new pro-Western government suppressed ethnic Russians in eastern and southern Ukraine. Unquote. Okay, so here are the additions. The editor replaced pro-Russian president with pro-Russian elected government. Mm. That's an interesting change. Okay, let's go on. He added the word color to the maiden revolution. The original story just said maiden revolution. And he also added this sentence after a referendum as the new pro-Western government suppressed ethnic Russians in eastern and southern Ukraine. That all of it was new. The referendum that did happen after Russia annexed Crimea has been widely rejected. The UN General Assembly declared it invalid, and very few countries have recognized its legitimacy. Now, what's fascinating is the defense of the journalist who's been doing this, and here's uh, how it's been quoted in many, many articles about this. Quote, a digital journalist has been placed on leave. They told a separate RNZ program, Checkpoint, that they have been editing stories in the same way for five years, and quote, no one has tapped me on the shoulder and told me I was doing anything wrong. Unquote. The agency has so far reviewed 250 stories and 16 have been corrected. So, I mean, that's not that many. Uh, They're all related to Russia and Ukraine. And I do have a bit of sympathy for anybody that feels like they should have had some oversight because honestly, folks... (laughs) I mean, how did you miss this? Anyway, uh, very clear that we are entering a new phase of uh, the war in Ukraine as the air campaign becomes much, much more important. And the messages that are coming out about what is happening there are obviously becoming more important. The stakes are higher. Those are your headlines for Tuesday, June 13th. I'm Nora, and today is Sandy Nora Day. So yay, stay tuned. There's going to be a new episode that drops in a couple of hours. And I'll talk to you tomorrow.